This video is going to take us through tutorial 3.2 and 3.3 and these we will be looking at doing grids and positioning. So starting with the empty file, this is the file that has the div information in it that allows us to set up our different rows and columns. So we have a header row at the bottom there will be a footer row within that then there's going to be another row within that row there's going to be a column that's two-thirds and a column that's one-third and the two-third column it's going to have two more rows of two so it'll be a two by two grid within that there will be a picture and text that appears above it in the interest of expediency I have followed the instructions in the book to in the PC about text file that then has the HTML content put into it, into each of the rows and columns. It also is doing the step it tells us to do at the very end, and it is linking to our three required pages. We have a reset page, the grids page, and the styles page. All we really need to do with our HTML pages. So the next step is to focus on the CSS and what's going to happen with that. And the first thing that we're going to do in the CSS is we are going to help our different rows and we will set the row here where we will give it the clear property so that it will now clear out any floats that are happening because we're going to take each of our columns and float them within the row so that we can start stacking things side by side instead of on top of each other. And the next thing we're going to do is because we are floating we need to then use our clear fix where we use the pseudo element of after so div dot row two colons indicating this is a pseudo element we use the word after and then within this we will clear both possible float combinations we will set the content to an empty string so it's just two quotation marks and finally we will set the display property to table. So this is the standard clear fix. It's something that we'll use regularly when we are doing a float based layout. This is what the page looks, at, looks like. So we can see that we have our top heading. Then we have in our two-thirds row will have all of this information will be put in that. Our one-third row is going to have this, so it will create a right column. And there is the footer that's going to show up down at the bottom. As we now have this set up, the next thing that we need to do is we need to start setting up our columns. And the first thing that we can do is we can take all of our columns and we can start setting their different width properties. Now the naming scheme that we're using on here is we attach a class and within that class we call it call and then we designate a size. So in this case 2-3 indicates this column should be a two-third width column. So as we set up these classes I can say div dot call dash one dash one and now I'm saying that's a fraction of one divided by one that's a hundred percent so that means this column is going to be a hundred percent wide column but I have to say what's been a hundred percent and I will put in width so when your color coding disappears from your code that's probably a good indicator that you may have forgot something while you were typing now this next one is going to be diff call dash one dash two so that's one divided by two so that means I now have a width of fifty percent then I will go div dot call dash one dash three and that is going to have a width of thirty three percent and continuing I'll go div dot call dash one dash or dash two dash three so this one is two divided by three so that's going to be my width of sixty seven percent and I will then continue on and go div call dash one dash four for a twenty five percent width now we may not use all of these different sizes 
on this particular project. But if we create these, then down the road we may decide that we can just recycle this into a new project and don't have to we could either reuse the style sheet or copy paste this chunk and by defining all these styles it gives us more flexibility as we're setting it up. So now that we have set the width of all of these items we can see what happens when we start to look at it. We can see things are now taken on different sizes. That's good. The next thing that needs to happen is we need to get them all to show up next to each other and to do that we want to float them. And to achieve this floating, we're going to use a selector method. And the selector method that we are going to use is a way to select all classes that begin with call dash. So to select a class that begins with call dash, I can say div. And now I put a square bracket inside the square bracket. I want to say all classes. And I'm going to use the special character of the uh, up caret. I don't know its actual name, but we'll go with that. And inside quotes, I will say call dash. And that now says I want to select all classes on divs that begin with call dash. And then put my curly braces, and I can simply say float left. Save it, reload, and our page now takes shape, which is pretty cool. Now that my page is page has taken shape. Another thing that the book shows us that's happening is how to put outlines on things and for this I can just go div outline one pixel solid red. So we can choose different kinds of outlines, different colors and different types. So they can be solid, it can be dashed, grooved, there's a variety of those. That would be my outline style, outline width, and outline color. So we can set all of these properties, go back into our document, and we can see where it now puts these on screen and helps us to better see and understand what is happening within our grid. To doing this selector, so the book has some information on it, but another good resource when looking at doing complex selectors or atypical selectors W3Schools has a really nice reference on it, so I can look up here and see what's going on and try and find. So this is what we used. and so In this case, it selects every anchor element whose href attribute begins with HTTPS. So we can see anchor element inside square brackets, it's href attribute, so which attribute, and then begins with, that's the kind of the up caret and then equals. So if I want to see that in action or practice it, I can click on it here brings me to more information on it. I can click try it myself. Here it is. So in this case, it's selecting classes that begin with the word test. So if they end in test, doesn't work. But if they begin with text, it does work. But it's only doing divs. That's why this paragraph with the class of test is not working. But if I were to take in the second one and just add the word test to its name, hit the button, we can see now it added that yellow background color to that one as well. W3Schools, great resource. Use them. They will help you work through some of your projects. 3.3, which is going to be PC underscore info underscore text HTML. You can see this is the page before we've linked to any of our styles. We can see there's the images in their natural form, our navigation. There's no coloring or styling going on. So the first thing that we are going to want to do as we work through this is in our HTML, in the head section, we need to link to any style sheets that we're going to be using. In this case, I'm going to first link to my PC underscore reset underscore text dot CSS file. Then the next item that I'm going to link to is going to be my PC underscore styles 3.css. And the final one that I'm going to link to is going to be my PC underscore info underscore txt.css file. And once I've done that, I'm pretty much done in the HTML file here. 
so I can close that browser, don't need to look there. And if we study what's happening here, we'll see that gutter header, that's where our navigation header image is. Then the rest of the page is contained in this main section where it has a bunch of things within it. Repeating divs, each one info1, info2, info3, they all have the info class, info box class on them. They're all part of the infographic main section, but each div has a unique ID ID, info1, info2, all the way through 8. Then there's a footer down at the bottom. So now that I have linked to those items, if I go here and refresh my page, we'll see that now we have most of the pages laying out and it looks decent. The only thing that we need to do to finish this up is to figure out how to position these elements on screen. And to position these elements on screen, we need to add in some basic styles. The first thing that we are going to do is to set under main, on the main I will set my position relative. This is now setting a position property because in each of the individual infographics, info 1 through 8, are going to be positioned absolutely so they will be positioned relative to the margins of the main block instead of relative to the entire viewport window itself. The next thing is to set the height of it and I will set my height in this case up to 1400 pixels. We're doing it to set it big so we have room to fit all of our pictures on and I will set its width to 100% of its parent. The body has a width set to 95% and then there's a min width and a max width size attribute attached to it and we want this to be 100% of whatever that value is. So now that we've done that, that's a good setup for main, doesn't really change anything. The next thing we're going to do uh, is to start working with our infographic on here and setting that up. And we need to modify our info box properties. So I can go div info box and what we're going to do is set their display property to none. And the reason for doing that is as we look at the page and everything's running out of the box. Now if I refresh, none of those show up and we see we have a clean page waiting for our first infographic to show itself on screen. Now after we've done that, we are going to set this infographic property so I can go div and then we're referencing an ID. So classes we use dot IDs, we use hashtag info and this is info1. Info 1, we will set its display property to block. We're going to position its top at 20 pixels, and I will put its left at 5%. Now, the width is set to 5% because when we look at the body here, the body is set between 640 and 960 pixels, or 95% of the screen. So when I'm, it won't be smaller than 640, it won't be bigger than 960, but anywhere in between it'll be 95% of the available space. So it has a little bit of fluidity as the body can slowly change size down to a certain point. Once we hit 640, it stops going smaller. We get 640, now I see margins, it grows, 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 hits 960, and now the margins just keep growing. So we have this min width and max width on it, otherwise it's 95% of available window. But with the infographics we do want to position those because we want to we told our info boxes not to show. Now I'm also going to say info box. I want to set its position property to absolute. This will now position it absolutely within the main element because we say position absolute on an element, in this case info, this div right here, class of info box, we're positioning it absolutely in relation to the last position parent element. In that case, main has position on it, so it's now being positioned relative to that. If I save what I'm working on and refresh, we'll see there the heart has been positioned on screen. Now this 5%, if I were to put this at 50%, we 
we would see its left margin is now at 50% of the screen. Now as I resize my window, as the window gets smaller, it stays at 50% while the window is scaling until the window reaches its smallest possible size and then it doesn't move any further. So that's because the width is variable. Where the height is going to be as big as we need it to fit the content, it makes sense to set our left margin based on a percentage. If I set it to a hard number, so if 960, if I go up to 680, so we're not um, 480, so we're at half of the 960. If I set it at 480 pixels, now refresh the page, works good when we're at the max size, but now when my window shrinks, we can see it gets closer and closer to the margin, so yeah, that doesn't work quite as well. So when we have a resizing parent, and it's based on a percentage, it makes sense to position our margins based on a percentage as well. So all of my info blocks now, info 1 through info 8, are all going to follow the same structure. They're just going to have different values. So I have completed putting in my top and left values for each one of my info boxes. Info 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Each one has a different percentage for my left value and a different top for the top value. Save that, go back into my main page, reload it. We can see how they now show up on screen. So now they nicely can fit within that 1400 pixel area. And this works well if we want a scrolling page. If we don't want a scrolling page, if we want our content to show on screen, we can actually take this main element and compress it down by controlling its overflow property if we've changed its size. So going back up in my document where it's 1400, just comment that out and I'll add a different height value in. And this time if I put in a value of 450 pixels, refresh the page, we can see that, okay, now it fits on screen, that's nice, but all of my content has spilled out. But what's a fun property is we can now set the overflow, and if we set it to auto, it will go, okay, well, we'll make this box smaller, but we'll automatically add in a scroll bar. And now when I do that, we can see there's my content, and it's within this box, and it has its own scroll bar. The whole page isn't scrolling just within this box area. So that's a fun property that we can put on. We can also force it to scroll. So if we say, I no, I need that to scroll and I want to make sure it has a scroll bar, we can put that on. And when we do that, it also adds that scroll bar to the bottom even though we don't need it. So we do get that. So forcing scroll in there can be visually distracting. Auto just gives it the scroll that it determines it needs in this particular situation. If we don't want it to scroll, if we want to have content hidden, now there's no scroll bar, but my content extends down, so nobody knows unless they look at the source code that there's more content on the page. We typically use that if we're doing image galleries and other things where we have a uh, whole row or column of images, but we're only showing a single one or a window of one at any given time, and we're able to then maneuver it around. We sometimes will use a JavaScript to help us with that, but there are ways to do it all through CSS. But going back to auto, that now gives me the scroll bar that I need to see what is happening. And that concludes 3.3.